I'm Chris Potts. This video is the first in our unit on building effective distributed word representations for semantics. I think it makes sense to just dive in. So here's a typical starting point for building distributional models. It's the upper left corner of a very large matrix I derived from a collection of movie reviews on IMDb. The rows are labeled with words, which are just given in alphabetical order, and the columns are labeled with document indices. The cell values then give the number of times that each word appeared in each document. So, for example, this value here means that the word ago occurred twice in document 4. The rows are the starting point for our word representations, and the columns are bag of word representations of each document, in that they record which words appeared in which documents and how often, but they don't encode the order that the words appeared in in the underlying texts. Throughout this lecture, we'll focus on the rows, that is, on the word representations. Now, matrices like this are the starting point for us in that the raw counts don't turn out to be especially good representations for getting at word meaning. This unit is largely about messing around with these counts so that they encode meaning. Let's begin with some guiding hypotheses. Uh, the idea that meaning might be reflected in or derivable from distributional information is a very old one. Uh, every discussion of vector space models must include this memorable line from the American linguist John Rupert Firth. It says, you shall know a word by the company it keeps. This second quotation from Firth begins to articulate the underlying scientific principle. Firth says, the complete meaning of a word is always contextual, and no study of meaning apart from context can be taken seriously. Noam Chomsky's early teacher Zelig Harris was also an advocate of a radical distributional approach to all of linguistic meaning. Here Harris says, distributional statements can cover all of the material of a language without requiring support from other types of information. And finally, the guiding hypothesis for us is stated directly in this quotation from Turney and Pentel's extremely useful overview of these models. They say, if units of text have similar vectors in a text frequency matrix, then they tend to have similar meanings. That sounds a bit dry, but as you'll see, it's an inspiring idea. Let's review some general questions that vector space modelers might ask, uh, and assume for now that we have a word by document matrix. So we could ask, how do the rows relate to each other? This is the question that we're focused on in this lecture. Uh, we could also ask, how do the columns relate to each other? This might be related to a task involving the relationships between documents or the clustering of documents. The next two questions move up a level. We could ask for a given group of documents, D, which words epitomize D. This might be a search for effective keywords, for example. And we could also ask for a given group of words, W, which documents epitomize W. This is the classic information retrieval task where the uh, given group of words is a query to a search engine. Let's review some matrix designs just briefly as examples. Now, we began this lecture by looking briefly at a word by document matrix. That's certainly the most widely used design, since it continues to be the backbone for modern web search engines. But I want to show you a few others to get you thinking creatively about models you might build yourselves. Uh, the designs are just examples of the many, many possibilities out there. Here's that word by document matrix again. There's just one more thing I want to point out about it. It's very sparse. There are lots of zeros. Of course, most words don't appear in most documents. This sparseness can be an advantage in terms of efficient computation and comparison, and it can bring out important distinctions, but it's not my favorite setup for computational semantics. I tend to prefer dense matrices like this one. Implicit in the design is a notion of co-occurring context. For this example, the notion of co-occurrence is just being in the same document. So, for example, this 39 here means that the words against an agent appear 39 times together in documents in this corpus. Now, IMDB reviews are pretty long, and we have a very permissive notion of context, so this matrix, matrix is especially dense. There are almost no zeros, which is a real contrast from the word by document matrix we just looked at, which comes from the same underlying corpus. If we had a stricter notion of co-occurrence, say, occurring in the same sentence or the same noun phrase, then the matrix would be less dense. These matrices can be easier to work with computationally. If you settle on a vocabulary of, say, 5,000 words, 
then your matrix is 5,000 by 5,000, no matter how big your corpus is. In contrast, the word by document matrix gets bigger as you add more data. In any event, I've found that, impressionistically, word by word matrices yield better representations than word by document ones, but I imagine others would offer more or less opposite advice. Here's a design that's more unusual. I've called it a word by discourse context matrix. The columns here are dialogue act tags used in the switchboard dialogue act corpus. And they encode things like interjection and agreement. For example, this 95 here means that the word absolutely occurred 95 times in agreement dialogue acts. So you can probably already see that useful structure would emerge from this design. Okay, and here's one that's even more unusual. It's not a strictly distributional design in that the data don't come directly from usage, but that's healthy. As you'll see when we look at neural representations and the like, we aren't wedded to the distributional concept in its strictest form. Uh, this matrix has phonological, phonological segments labeling its rows. The symbols come from the International Phonetic Alphabet. It happens that all the symbols you can see here are vowels. So for example, this one is like the A in cat. Uh, and this is like the awe in dog or bought. Uh, and the columns are labeled with phonological features. So the rows summarize the analyses that phonologists give to these vowels. They're break down into discrete features. Here's a visualization of the high dimensional data in two dimensions using an algorithm called T-distributed stochastic neighbor embedding, which we'll study later. Uh, and it looks great. There's lots of structure here that phonologists would find intuitive. For example, here are a bunch of rhotic sounds like er. Uh, up here we have a bunch of nasals like m, n, and ng, uh, and so forth. Just to get your creative juices flowing even more freely, here are some other designs uh, involving parsing annotations or different interactional settings or different kinds of objects. For example, here we're analyzing people and their preferences. And the last two designs uh, involve three dimensions. We won't cover this, but most of the material in this unit that I define in terms of vectors and matrices can be generalized to objects of even higher dimensions. By way of wrapping up this lecture, let me step back for a minute to give you a fuller overview of vector space models as we'll study them. My basic message is that there are lots and lots of options. This gives you great power, but it can also be a little unsettling since there are always new combinations you could try. First, you have to settle on the right matrix design. This will have a huge impact on outcomes, and this list actually hides a lot of complexity. You also have to make a lot of pre-processing decisions concerning how to tokenize, whether to add part of speech tags or parse the data, and so forth, you might also want to make decisions about what to include in your vocabulary or which documents to exclude. Or you might decide to merge documents, for example, to treat all of a single person's tweets as a single document in a word-by-document matrix. Next, you probably won't want to deal directly with the counts that fill your initial matrix. They typically aren't the best guide to meaning. To begin massaging your matrix into a better form, you'll probably reweight it to try to amplify important distinctions and diminish unimportant ones. We'll study these algorithms carefully. Next, to try to capture even more abstract notions of co-occurrence or association, you might run a dimensionality reduction algorithm like latent semantic analysis. This could give you an um, even more compact and powerful representation. And I should mention that in this course, We'll look at algorithms like word to vec or glove for global vectors that actually combine these two steps, possibly taking raw counts as inputs and both reweighting and performing dimensionality reduction at the same time. And the other, other innovation that we'll study is that at some stage in here, you might introduce some supervised information, some labels that ground these vectors in the world or in emotional spaces and so forth. Finally, your inspection of the model and your assessment of it will involve vector comparison. Here again, as we'll see in the next unit, there are lots and lots of options. So here's the challenge. Nearly any combination of these things makes sense. You can combine basically any matrix with any weighting, dimensionality reduction, and comparison method. Only few of the combinations really don't make sense mathematically. 
This is daunting. It's freeing in that there's lots of room for exploration and careful analysis, but also exhausting, as one always has a nagging worry that a slightly different approach would have been better.